my name is Baron Coilus, and I work at the European Variation Archive as a bioinformatician. And this webinar will essentially go through what the European Variation Archive is, um, how you can submit data to the European Variation Archive, and how you can also access data. Towards the end of the webinar, we'll also take a look at the latest release data. So this would be data that's come into the EVA and now being assigned unique identifiers and released back out into the research community for you to use within publications or manuscripts or papers. So just a bit of a background um, on what I do. Um, I'm originally trained as a wet lab scientist in the genetics of human disease. Um, I've done some uh, bioinformatician work at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and then from there I've been at the EBI now since 2018, working on the various pipelines that we have to validate and archive variation data at the European Variation Archive. So what we'll also start with is um, a roadmap of what the webinar will go through. So again, I'll start with the EVA and an introduction into how we sit in the EBI because we interact with a lot of different teams and we exchange data such as sample data of biosamples and Ensemble, another big database. From there, I'll move on to the submission process in the EVA, um, what it entails, what it includes, and some things and tools that can be used before preparing data to submit to the EVA. Then I'll move on to variant clustering and remapping. So this is after data has been ingested into the EVA, what happens to that variant data? And then how can it be reused by another researcher? How can it be reused in future processes? Lastly, we'll have a data access and website demo. We'll actually go onto the website, take a look at how the data is um, um, sort of highlighted and how the data is uh, able to be accessed via the FTP website. We have various study browsers and web on variant browsers. And then lastly, we'll finish off with some final notes just to summarize everything we've done throughout the um, webinar itself. So to carry on, we'll just start with a brief introduction to the EPI and EVA. For those of you who are already familiar with the EVA, I do apologize. Um, for those of you who aren't, we are a fair primary resource at the EBI. And what do we mean by fair data? Well, the what we try to ensure is that the biological data that is being generated now, um, it's at large scale. We're moving into this big age of big genomic data that's being developed, this big variation data. And with the ease of being able to sequence genomes comes the ease of being able to analyze variants. Um, well, I say ease, the variant data can be quite complex, but then we are generating this big data that needs to be archived, sorted, and made available. So with FAIR data, um, if you look at any primary resource in bioinformatics, you'll usually find a reference to FAIR data. And what we're trying to do in the community is ensure that the data we have is findable, in that we assign these globally unique and persistent queryable variant identifiers. So if we once data is submitted to us, if you find a identifier that's in our database, you should be able to then find the identifier in another database. The second thing is that the data also needs to be accessible. We are archiving this data, we're ensuring that the data is in the database, and we need to ensure that this data can be accessed anywhere in the world. Um, we promote the open access data. It needs to be universally accessible and open and free. We do need to also ensure the data is interoperable. This means that the FAIR identifiers um, that we are assigning to these variants, they are of a standard quality. So we're not just ingesting and making variant data available that is of any old quality. It needs to abide, in our case, it needs to abide by the um, standard formats and it needs to be in a machine readable format because we're essentially making sure that we're moving into an age of machine learning and automation and the format of the variant data needs to be in a, for, um, a format that's readable by many different types of software. And lastly, the data needs to be reusable. And um, this just means that uh, the data, the variant data we're ingesting that we're making available, the process and analysis that was done to make this variant data, 
it has adequate associated metadata. You can see the platform, the sequencing platform that was used, and you can follow the analysis of the pipeline, such as if it was done using Novo Align to map the variants against the reference genome, and then if BCF tools or the GATK, the genome analysis toolkit was used to call the variants. So it just essentially provides that evidence that here's the variant. I've 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 found this variant. This is indeed a variant, and it's um this is the pipeline I use to analyze this variant and make it available. You should be able to use the same software and analyze the variant as well and find any um from there you can find use it in any sort of research if you want to find a, a disease phenotype association or anything like that. So where do we let me just move this to the corner a bit. So where do we reside? We are in the EBI. As you know, the EBI is a home for biological data services, research and training. And we act as the open, fair primary resource for the storage of variant data. And that's any variant data. So whether it be SNPs or Indels or larger structural variants. Um, and that's from any species as well. So this is just the structure of the clusters we have at the EBI at the moment. So we reside in the genetic variation and disease data cluster here. You can see that we have um, some of our partner databases, such as the Mouse Informatics database and with the European Genome Phenome Archive. They only deal with human sensitive human data. So it's the data is open access, but you do need to go through certain data access um, committees to be able to access the data. It's not as simple as going onto the um, EGA website and being able to um, browse the data that's readily available. We also um, interact with databases outside of our own cluster. So if you look on the right, you can see that Biosamples is here. The sample data that Biosamples store is also made available in the EVA and vice versa. We exchange the sample data. There's some uh, data exchange with Ensemble. Ensemble ingest some of the variant data you'll see from the EVA in their regular releases. And then we also have some um, literature um, from the Europe PMC. So this goes back to the point that the variant data is coming into us. We need to have the associated metadata and ensure that the metadata can be cross-linked back to the publication. So just some figures, I won't spend too long on this slide, but this is just showing what's in the EVA. So we hold, about, currently it's about 3.4 plus billion variants across 227 species. We hold the variants, we hold the metadata, so that includes the study, experiment, analysis, pipeline, and samples. And then lastly, we also run the variant effect predictor on the variants that come in. So this is Ensemble's variant effect predictor tool, and that provides us information on the effect of the gene on the effects of the variant on the gene of the transcript, the most of it functional consequence and information such as population frequencies across studies. So that's the basis of what we're doing. Um, when you're generating variant data, you come to the EVA, submit your variant data to the EVA, and we archive the data. But what are the big bigger implications of actually doing so? So the first thing I'll cover is just the information on the submission to the EVA. What we actually need, what is provided to us, what validation checks we do, and then what is provided back to you as a submitter. The first thing that happens is that as a submitter, you have your, this is you, little green bubble as a submitter. This is you having your variant data files in VCF, valid VCF format files an associated EVA metadata template file, which is downloaded from the EVA website. Um, I'll briefly take a look at where that's located when we go through the demo, just so if any of you are interested in submitting data, you're not struggling to find where that file is. That These two files are prepared on the submitter side. So we do have some validation tools available in um, uh, EVA validation suite. And um, on the next slide, I'll demonstrate what that validation entails. But what actually happens at the moment is that you have these two files or multiple VCF files. You then contact the EVA help desk, send the files through. We usually open an FTP where you can upload the files. And then we run that through a data validation pipeline, which checks that the VCF is in the correct format. Small things such as if there's any white spaces at the end of lines, um, anything that 
which ensures that these files can be machine readable by other resources or other types of software. It also checks the metadata file to ensure that the metadata itself as well is to a certain standard. There's some controlled vocabulary, such as the sequencing platforms used for the data. Once that's passed the validation pipeline, what's provided back to the submitter is very important. So the EVA project ID is first provided back to the submitter. Now, if you do have a manuscript and you are submitted to a journal, this is one of the main things they're asking for as proof of submission, this project ID. And it's always prefixed to a PRJEB and then usually a five character numeric string. And that will be your proof of submission in that my variant data has been deposited. If you're writing your manuscript, um, you'll be writing, you know, here's the, um, this is the statistics, here's the conclusion. The raw data is available um, using this project ID and then you're called to the project ID. This lets anyone know that's reading the publication, hey, if I need to grab the raw data, I can go into one of these open access databases and the data will be available. So that's one project ID per submission, but you can also have multiple analysis IDs underneath. Usually analysis ID is provided per VCF file, but there are cases where um, you mainly find um, there's a VCF file, multiple VCF files fall under one analysis. An example of this is um, usually you'll find that some sequencing is done um, per chromosome, and then there's a VCF file produced per chromosome. But in, there's also cases where that you, you can also um, merge those files into a single VCF file. But the general consensus is that we have an analysis ID per VCF file. So going into, on the previous slide, we have this data validation pipeline, a bit more detail on that. And this is the actual data validation pipeline we do. So there is certain requirements that the VCF files need to have for it to be able to be submitted to the EVA. This is an example of a raw submitted VCF file that's being submitted to us. So we have the chromosome here. So chromosome one, the position. There's no information in the ID column, which we'll um, get onto in a moment. But then we have the reference alternative and quality filters, um, sorry, quality um, columns within the header line. What we're looking at in this particular example is that the reference um, allele column for this particular position has a T. This is the GCA accessioned assembly from NCBI. And what it needs to match is that the position on chromosome one, this is obviously not that high of a position, but if you're looking at it from that uh, position that needs to match, this T allele will need to match the T allele found on the genome assembly itself as well. So we perform an assembly check and we also perform a format check on the VCF itself. And if you take a look at the, um, the this will be shared as well, there's a validation suite available on the GitHub um, repo, which you can download onto your local machine and run on your variant files. It's actually a very good idea because it cuts down the time needed to submit data to the EVA and stops this back and forth of communication, which um, can, can be quite time consuming at times. So going on to that, what's happened now is that the data has been archived in the EVA. You have your project ID, then what do you want to do with that project ID? You've provided it back to the journals. Um, you, your manual, your um, publication has been accepted. But then we also need to be able to provide identifiers to individual VCFs, to the individual variants, apologies, um, that have been submitted to us. So on this slide, you'll see that this is the same VCF that was submitted to us, where we have the chromosome, the position, the ID, reference and alternative alleles. But previously, as you saw, the ID column was left empty, and we're just using a full stop character to portray that there's nothing in the ID column. There's no ID for the particular variant at the moment. So once the once we confirm the VCF has been archived, that goes through our variant exceptions database. And it spits out the same VCF, but now you can see that the ID column has been populated by these SSIDs. And these SSIDs are the single SNP variant identifiers that are assigned to each variant, and they are unique across studies. So if you submit a study to us, 
but someone else submits the same sort of analysis and they say, hey, I found the variant on the against the same genome sequence, um, your SSID will be unique to your study. So what that means would be clarified in the next part in the variant clustering and remapping section. So now we are accepting these variants, they're being assigned these SSIDs. And um, more often than not, if you are going through publications, you'll find that RSIDs are used to reference variants rather than SSIDs. So what we want to do is um, we want to cluster the SSIDs into an RSID. So for example, in the first part of this figure, you'll have that this is an initial submitted variant. It's on the um, cow assembly, this uh, UMD 3.1.1. And at chrom on chromosome one, position one, two, three, someone saying, hey, I found a variant. Um, it's submitted to the EVA. We assigned and identify SS111. Somewhere, somewhere, someone halfway across the world also does the same type of analysis um, on their sample, on their cow sample. Use the same genome assembly to analyze the variant. It says, hey, I also found a variant submitted to the EVA, and that's assigned uh, ID of SS222, for example. And then the same thing happens in another scenario, and it's assigned an SSID of 333. Periodically, these are now clustered. These SSIDs are now clustered into a single RSID, and we refer, we refer to that as a clustered, or clustered variant. So what you more often than not find is that RSIDs are a very good way to sort of back up the association that I indeed... Indeed, what I've found is a variant. Other researchers are also finding this variant, and um, I'm going to use it to reference my variant whenever I discuss um, the variant within my various publications. But then we need to go a step further. So what this means is that we're trying to still keep within lines of fair data. We need to ensure that all the data can be queried, all this data we're doing can be queried, these identifiers are permanent, unique identifiers, but um, these have been assigned for years. The previous responsibility before 2017 was dbSNP. So now we need to make sure that um, with new technologies being um, invented and discovered and the ease of being able to sequence genomes, we need to ensure that these variant identifiers can go across um, genome assemblies and builds. So the first thing we want to do is that this is an example here of an SSID that's been found on this region, on this original reference genome, we're going to say is the blue assembly. And it's a variant that's um, it's supposed to be an A, but we found a C in this certain individual. We perform a remapping using the flanking sequence and we match the flanking sequence onto the newer genome assembly build and then record the newer genome assembly the uh, green assembly and then this means that the ssid ss triple one has now been mapped onto the newer genome assembly and we'll, uh, we'll, it's still ss triple one so we're still preserving the unique identifier that this variant has been assigned But then what happens when we receive more information coming in, um, sometimes referencing the variant on the new assembly? So the idea is that we want to ensure that the full catalog of SS and RSIDs can always be found using the newest genome assembly. Now, the newest genome assembly is something we had to sort of go out into the community and say, what's the latest, what, what is the most popular and newest genome assembly? that's being used within a particular community. So if you take a look on the left-hand side, this was the original, um, the previous slide, sorry, that showed that SS111 has been relog um, remapped onto the newer green assembly, and it remains, it retains its same SS111. When the clustering happens, the clustering happens on the newest reference genome. So again, this GIA green assembly, and you can see that the RSID is being assigned, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and SS111 is being assigned underneath this RSID. SS444 is now a new submission, but the new submission is saying that I have found this variant on this newer assembly. 
the SS444 was never originally submitted using the older blue reference genome assembly. So then that means that these two are um, clustered under the green, the newer green assembly. But um, we will take a look at how you can backtrack and find the footprint of when these um, RSIDs and SSIDs were generated and assigned. Because if then if you look into the information on SS111, you'll find that, hey, it will say, well, it's on this green, newer green assembly, but it was originally reported on the older blue assembly. So we'll take a deeper look at that when we go through the, um, the EVA demo. So just to carry on, I can see we have some questions in q and I'll finish up and please save some time where we can go through some of those other questions as well. So I'll quickly move on to data access. Now we're assigning these IDs and they need to be able to, it's not only for submission and to get your publication accepted, this data also needs to be available to other researchers and they need to be able to access the data, um, browse the data, download the data if need be, and access the data via computational methods. So we have four methods of data access. We have the study browser, which we'll take a look at. And the study browser is a good way to if you have a study in mind and you already know which study you want to find, you can simply go into the study browser and download the raw data. You can query them by the project ID, the unique identifier that submitters receive when they browse their data. So more often than not, it's when someone's reading a paper and they can see the project ID, they can go into the study browser, enter the project ID, and there's areas to download the raw data we'll take a look at within the demo. We also have the variant browser, which is quite popular when you want to query variants um, within a region and download, do a bulk query and download the um, variants, your, your variants of interest, either in a comma separated value file or in a VCF file as well. The last two, we have an FTP, which is a bulk download per species, per assembly, per study. Um, an FTP also allows computation um, methods of access. The FTP also allows, um, it's where our data um, releases are going to be found, we'll take a look at. So these RS releases that um, the RS IDs that are clustered and then released out and periodically, they're going to be made available via our FTP. And then lastly, we have the REST API, which again, it provides the same information you would find in the study browser and the variant browser but it just allows computational methods of access. And um, you'll see that we're working on um, some training material that you can download onto your local machine. And if you wish to sort of automate the process of downloading variant data from the EVA, you can do so via some Python scripts. And so this is an example of how data is um, consumed from the EVA. Ensemble use our API. So if you go to the Ensemble page um, and you are looking for a particular variant, you may find that the, the variant is listed as being imported from the EVA. So you can see three sources for a cow, um, a crab eaten macaque, and a dog where they've consumed the variant data from the EVA because the EVA is the primary resource where the variant data has been submitted to. And then Ensemble, through their regular re releases, they consume data from the EVA, the variant data from the EVA, and then make that available on their website as well. And then this is also done through other resources such as the UCSC Genome Browser. So this is one of the, the examples of an RSID that's been consumed via our release three. So our previous release, because, because we're on release four now, and it's just made available on the UCSC browser. And what that, sorry, apologies. What that shows is that um, you can find, you can use these unique identifiers cross database and you should be able to cross reference and find the same information between our databases. Again, it's going back to fair data principles and that we want to ensure that everything is cross referenced and everything can be um, uh, searched across resources. So coming out of the slides, I just want to go onto the EVA website. So I usually go on to, if you just search EPI EVA, this website, this, this would be the home page where it displays some uh, basic information. I'll zoom in a bit, apologies. 
So it displays some information on the home page that's actually quite of interest. So one thing we wanted one you can see at the top there's some tabs to sift through different types of um things we have such as the study browser and the variant browser. But one of the first things to note is that on the actual home page itself it has the search for SNPs box which is quite um useful in that um if you just have a some um, an RS or SSID you're researching and you have that in mind already you can simply come onto the home page enter it into the box and then it'll bring up the associated variant information um so we will take a look at that in a moment and it also has the release for FTP as I said the FTP access will have and some information on the API so again the API is used for computational methods of access but if you actually click on this API link and um, we'll take a look at a deeper look at this in a moment this will take you out to a Swagger documentation, which is essentially a UI that you can use to build up API queries. But just starting with the actual web page itself, I don't want to dive into those too early. I want to take a look at the web page itself just to show the different things we have on the website that you can take a look through. So the first thing is the summit data page. Again, it does have quite a bit of information, but this is essentially what I spoke about during the um, earlier slides in that you need to prepare the VCF, the metadata template file, which is an Excel file, um, spreadsheet file, can be downloaded from here. The contact for to begin the validation and submission process can be started from e by emailing the EVA help desk. And there's some additional information such as the, um, the, the genome assembly, um, INSDC ID we're asking for, and the um, one of the things that I could, apologies I forgot to mention is that the VCF files that are coming into us they need to have either the allele frequency data or the genotype data just so we can sort of calculate these statistics and verify that this is indeed a variant within this sample. But if you go onto the study browser, we follow the schema of having the filters on the left hand side and then the results window on the right hand side. So what you can do is filter by species, quite a number of species, sorry, I'm trying to scroll down to the bottom. And then you can also filter by the study type. So we have various study types, whether, whether it be targeted sequencing, exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. So I'll go back up to the top. And on the right hand side, you can see the results window, which displays any sort of query you're um, running, it'll display the genome. On the right hand side, you'll see ways to download the data, but the best way to bring up and highlight the study data itself is to find the, the relevant project ID, as you can see here. So these are the project IDs that are assigned during the submission process. So after your data has been submitted to the EVA, you get your project ID. So we'll take a look at the blood fluke, should be a study there. And the way to expand the data is you can click on the project ID. And this will take you out to the study page. So you have the study title at the top, the associated metadata information in these lines, such as the genome assembly, um, the source type and the sample it's been derived from tax ID for the species, the center of who's actually submitting the data to us. And then this description, which is a free text entry, this is provided by the submitter via the metadata um, file. So this allows you to put in information of what's actually been done and how you are highlighting this variant. There's space for a resource. So for this instance, if you take a look of, the, of well, it's load up in a moment. This should go out to the Parasite Worm Base website, as this is where the data has been derived from. I'll give that a bit to load. And then the publication, the associated publication as well, which is very important because if you are reading through the publication and, and you need to reference the data, you need to ensure that you can reference the raw data from the publication, but you can also find the publication from the raw data. You can also find the two links to the download files, the submitted files, which takes you out to the ENA to download the file, or the browsable files link, which opens up into our FTP, and then you are able to download the raw files here. Our Parasite worm bases are working at the moment. There you go. 
so this is one of the resources and this is where the um uh, the data actually came from so this database so it's just a nice way to ensure that everything's cross-referenced cross-linked and if you do take a look at the variant here you will be able to find where it's come from and if you need to essentially contact whoever's generated or curated the variant itself so going on to the variant browser it works in very much so the same way that the study browser works where you have the filters on the left hand side and then you have the results window on the right hand side and you can query the um data and find and download the sorry not query the data well you can query the data and download your results in um either csv format or vcf format you can also do that a bit you can also ex expand on that a bit further and um find some tabs here so the variant data you can go through and find the files that this variant has been found in per study the genotypes and the population statistics per study as well so this is one of the default queries we're looking at so a whole genome detection of six sequences um sequences of six horses from diverse, diverse breeds so for this particular study for this variant that's the, by default being selected up here to so intergenic variant c to t you can find that this one sample here displayed a um um heterozygosity while well, the other samples displayed some homozygosity but again the variant browser is a good way to visualize and query these variants um a lot of the times as well is the best thing to do is um what you'll find that uh, users usually query by the variant id as you saw on the home page via the rs or ssid or the ensemble gene symbol by default we have the bracket 2 popular gene so it's left on the um um it's a good way to query if you are doing a bulk query of something and you want to download the results at the same time as well going on to some more tabs we also um contributors for the gf the global alliance for genomics and health so that allows some information on some beacon um, api queries um the api page itself it's not the, it just provides some information on how to use the api we'll take a look at in the moment and in a moment and the rs release page which is updated um, every time we have an RS release so this is for RS release 4 which was done in November and it um it just has some summary statistics of what's actually available in this release and uh, what's new and any other um details on the release so for an example um on the this page for RS release 3 it was the first release where we had some remapping data from one um um a variant from one genome as we explained with the blue and green assemblies from one genome build to another and it just listed the assemblies that were involved in that remapping process but going back to the home page so the study and variant browser they do provide a ui to query that data but essentially what we want to look at is the first thing we want to look at is the release so if you go into the home page and you find um the ftp text and you click on the FTP it will take you out to the FTP access and that allows you to sift through the release data by assembly or by species so if you go by species oh sorry you can see that we have the scientific name for the species that you can sift through so these are all the species that are included in the release and then we're going to go for Bostaurus as well as popular and now this takes you to the assemblies which you want to query as the data is split by assembly so we have these assemblies first so which you some of you may recognize so the uh, btal 4.2 the btal 5 um 0.1 or the arcucd um assembly so those are the actually assembly names that we're using but then a bit lower down you can see that we also have the gca which is the insdc accession for the assembly um, which is mainly used when we're referencing fair data so you should be able to use this um this gca accession within if you take a look at ncpi you'll find the assembly using this gca accession but then if you look at a different websites such as the european nucleotide archive you should be able to find the same sequence using that gca as well so we're going to click into one of the gcas and what we'll find is multiple files that are available the most important one being this one here which is the current ids vcf.gz so it's a um, compressed vcf file containing the rsids for this um 
for this species for this um species and for this particular assembly as well. There are other files that are available. So for instance, there is the um, the deprecated ID file. And what we're finding is that um, the file, these files aren't as regularly used as the current IDs files. So what we, what we wanted to include is that when we're discussing fair data principles, again, these we want to ensure that any ID that is being assigned to these variants, there's a footprint of when it was done. But um, sometimes we found IDs that they couldn't be verified as there were factors that prevented us from describing the variant with the certainty that this was a variant. Um, one of the examples is that we couldn't find the reference or the variant type for this particular variant. So we couldn't say, hey, well, this is indeed, we didn't have enough evidence to say that this is a variant. A lot of the time, one of the questions we get is, well, why include these in the release if they're not going to be used or they're missing information? And the answer to that is it's fair data principles. We don't want to, as much as we're assigning these RSIDs, we need to make sure that everything we assign has a footprint, can be found. And um, at one point, this was assigned for a reason. So we can't exclude it totally from the release. And we need to ensure that any data we're gener generating is these are permanent identifiers. But we need to also ensure that we have some information associated of what's going on, why it's not included, and why this ID isn't being used anymore. It's, it's, this is especially the case as data is evolving and we're again becoming better and better at sequencing and analyzing um, alleles. Another type is the merged IDs. This is similar to the deprecated IDs. So these are previous IDs that have essentially been now been merged into RSID that has now been in use. So for whatever reason, they've been merged. The, the merged IDs were previously in use, but they've now been merged into one of these IDs. So what happens is if you do look at one of the current IDs that's in use, you may find that there's information on what the ID, um, what merged ID has been, what RSID has been merged into the current ID and what's actually being used at the moment as well. And then we also have a mixture of both, which is the deprecated and merged IDs. So what this is, is these are IDs that have been merged in the RSID, merged into a different RSID, but then the RSID was also then deprecated later on, whether that be to insufficient information Again, as I was previously saying, or the we can verify the variant type. But the important thing to take away from this is that we ensure that the variant IDs that are in use. So if you are looking for a particular variant and you're doing some research on a particular variant, it will be within the current IDs folder. But then we also have sort of a footprint of all the RSIDs with, that were generated in the past. And um, sort of this legacy data that needs to be sort of preserved in that sort of sense. So going back to the actual EVA website, anytime a release is done, we'll make an announcement about it. Um, it's essentially the clustering of the SSIDs into these unique RSIDs and that's made, um, made available. We also have the API. So on the homepage, this is again, back onto the homepage, you find this search for SNPs box. Um, you go into the API and you wanna find out, oh, well, how do I use this API? How do I create this API? Um, you may be um, quite versed at using computational methods of access, or you may be just learning computational methods of access. The Swagger documentation is a good way to look at how the API is used and um, build some queries using the Swagger documentation. So we have the, this is the Swagger documentation here. We have the options such as if you want to search by a clustered variant, you can click on the clustered variant and it, it has different options for you to filter the data and um, be able to search through the data. So for this instance, we want to find a clustered uh, variant by its identifier. So we're going to say, hey, I need to find this variant. Um, we're going to go with, I think I have one, that's a good example. So this is RS178-70277. And we're going to hit execute. And what that will do, I'll zoom out a bit, sorry. 
is that that will first give us the curl command we can use to essentially run this on the command line and return the same results um, if we do want to do a query via the command line and sort of integrate this query into a script or um, or uh, automated process. It will give you the URL endpoint that the API is querying to display the results. And then you'll see that the second documentation also provides the results body here. So this is what we're looking at. This is the results we're finding. You may see that there's multiple entries for this query and we'll get into why that is in a moment. So this will be the accession. So again, the RSID, um, the version, and then this will say, hey, it's from this GCA, this particular assembly, this species, on this particular chromosome, and this is the position that the variant is being found at. So that's one block. So it's provided back in the JSON format. So that's one block with the key and value elements. You can take a look at the second block and what this actually is. The reason we're getting multiple results for this single variant is because this is an example of a variant that has been remapped onto different assemblies. So you'll see that the information, such as the ID, that stays the same. It's still in the same species, but you'll find that things such as the GCA, referring to the assembly, has now changed. So it's gone from 3205.1, um, sorry, to 3795.2. So it's being remapped onto a different assembly. And with that comes a different um, accession for the contig, the chromosome. So for this one, this could be, I think it's referring to chromosome three, four, I'm not quite sure, but uh, this will be the unique accession for this particular chromosome. You can see that the accession has now changed because the assembly has changed. And also with that also comes the position change. Lastly, you'll see that this also takes place in the last block here as well. So the Swapping documentation is very good in that it provides you the curl command you can use. So then you can say, oh, well, it's provided me with this. I can now put this into a script. If you take the URL and put that into the browser, this is how the JSON format, the JSON information is returned. So you can see this is the same information that was returned by the um, Swagger body response. If this was, this is essentially if you run the API through the command line, it will be querying this data and you can find the information, associated information here as well. There are other types of information as well. So what I've done, I've run a separate query, I've put, um, I want to search, uh, I've edited the endpoint to include the submitted version of this um, this RSID. And what that does, it provides some additional information that's underneath this RSID, such as the SSID, who the projects actually come from, who submitted the variant. Um, it also provides some additional information that's only used internally at the moment, such as the validation and the mapping weight, um, which is just used internally at the EVA. But this is just another way to query using the API and find associated information underneath the, um, the RSID. So the track implementation is a very good way to do so. And um, it, it's a good way because it also provides you back the commands to use when you want to run these queries. You can also query the variant on the, um, the via the SNP search box, and that will bring up the information on the EVA website itself. Need to come on to load. And as you can see, this is a, just a simple query um the uh variant <clears throat> this is one of the variants that was originally um, provided by ncbi that we've now imported into the eva um the rs123 is always a good example and it's um human assembly the chromosome which is chromosome 7 and it provides the start date and the type of um variant snip um variant identify um the type of variant sorry so in this case it's a single nuclear type variant and you can see that this was created quite a while ago, this variant. So these identifiers have been assigned through a number of years, and we just need to ensure that they are um, conserved and that what we're doing can be sort of followed through to find the associated information. So I do apologize if that seems overwhelming in the tools that are made available, 
But what we are developing now is um, <clears throat> what we're finding is that the data used at the EVAs are mainly done through computational methods. Um, it's done where the API queries are implemented into um, scripts and the data is just automatically downloaded. An example you saw earlier was Ensemble. When they do their release, they run a well, they run essentially a script that downloads the variant data from our API and then they release it in their latest releases. So this is a um, Jupyter notebook that we're essentially working on, which will made, be made available in coming weeks. And what this does, it allows you to download the training um, notebook onto your machine. Well, run it virtually, essentially. And you can then <clears throat> see how the various scripts are used to automate the process of downloading um, what you need to find. So if you need to find an um, evidence for an RSID, so let's say you have an RSID in mind that, that you wish to find, what this does is that this shows you an example of how Python code is used to automate that process. And um, it walks you through the steps. And in some cases, you may just be able to, if you are searching multiple RSIDs, you can just change the RSID that you're looking at, and it will be able to provide that information back to you. So we can see that we have some endpoints here that are being queried, assigned variables, and then the information is being provided back. So for this example, we're using the boss tourist species again, which is so it's quite popular, and um, chromosome six. And then we're providing, if you take a look lower down, sort of the same JSON information that's provided back that we were looking at. So the project ID, the analysis ID, some of the information that's provided back the, by the variant effect predictor, such as the annotation. And then lower down, you can see that um, this example is being cut because there's a lot of samples within this study. But you can see that um, it provides the genotypes back for each of the samples associated with the study and the RSID we're um, trying to take a look at. So there is various methods and um, examples of how to do this. So we also can take a look at studies for species and variants in genes as well. But this will be made available soon. I know we'll make an announcement when you can take a look and see how to use the EVA data through the API as well. But I'll just carry on with the slides. We'll finish up because we have some, we'll make some time for some questions. So just some final notes <clears throat> to encompass everything that we've gone through. The EVA is a resource for genomic variation data from all species. You submit the data to us and we provide back these accessions for the project analysis and the variants, which usually are required when you are submitting your data to your publication, your manuscript to the journals. The archive data is then clustered. So the SSIDs that are assigned are then clustered into RSIDs. And um, the SSIDs are also remapped onto newer genome assemblies, new and emerging genome assemblies. And then we make this data available via the website and the release data through the FTP and also via API access. So the data can also be, the data ingestion can also be automated and um, accessed via computational methods. So this is the team that works on the EBI, the, the EVA, sorry, as well as some of our funding bodies. Okay, so with that, I think we should go into the Q&A. So we have, uh, uh, Two questions already there, Baron, for you. So one is, uh, what do you mean by SS and RS in variant IDs? So, <clears throat> sorry, the SSIDs are assigned, um, when the variant submitted to the EVA, the SSID is assigned to your specific variant. Um, so they're unique to your study and to your variant. It stands for, um, a single SNP for single, it sounds for single. I don't yeah. know what RSID actually stands for because yeah. they were. I think SS, yeah. SS is for submitted SNPs. Submitted, so. yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Because you don't see, you won't see SS um, referenced. You'll see the RSID. So the SSID will be unique to your study, to your variant. And then the, the RS, the SSID, sorry, will be unique to your study and your variant. And then those are clustered into the RSID. And those RSIDs are used for the main uh, variant identifiers. Yeah, and RS is RS stands for reference SNPs. So we have another question. Is uh, I think it's about EVA in general. Is it a database archive or also providing 
tools for variant calling or clustering variants? So it is essentially our job is just the database archive, but um, we also do provide tools not for variant calling and um, the tools we provide, not for clustering variant either, the tools we provide are to validate your VCF. So that could be a VCF that you're not intending to submit to the EBA, but you still want to make sure that your VCF is valid. And another thing that we also develop is the the, the variant remapping pipeline that we're using and this, the algorithm that, that's used to map a RSID from one um, assembly to another um, is also going to be made um, available as well. There's a few bugs we need to kick out and everything like that, but those are also going to be made open access um, pieces of software and tools as well. You'll find them on the, um, the GitHub uh, EVA page. Right. Uh, another question is about the type of data that uh, users can submit. So can we submit Sanger sequencing data? Um, you can submit Sanger sequencing data as long as the data is represented in VCF. The VCF is the only file type we accept at the moment. Um, so as long as the variant information is being submitted in VCF, that's fine. We can accept that data as well. OK, uh, next question is, can the data on EVA be accessed and analyzed by R as well as or only um, R or only by Python? So yeah, so it, it can also be done by R. Um, the reason we've done the notebook in Python was because um uh, the, the well, one of the developers that's working on that is actually more familiar with Python. It's mainly more familiar um, used to pass and especially because the results are provided in the JSON format and you need to be able to sort of access the various elements and uh, Python is very good at doing so. But yeah, it, it can also be done by R. We haven't look, looked into that, but yeah, that's that's possible as well. One question came in. Uh, is it possible to keep uploaded data not publicly available until paper we prepared is published? So yes, that's possible. Apologies, that's something I missed out during the slides. So you can update, you can upload um, data to the EVA. Um, within the metadata file, there's a section that says the whole date, and you can keep data private um, for a maximum of two years. Um, so you can set a date for next year. But then if your paper's accepted and published before, so you can just let us know, and then we will release the data whenever you want. How can we construct the data set of mutated sequences using EVA-DB? That I won't be 100% too sure about because that will mainly be going from, we accept the data in VCF and then we provide the data back in VCF. So I'm not sure how you'll then be able to use, I'm not 100% sure how you'll be able to then use that VCF data to um, construct the data set for mutated sequence. This is essentially, it's a, uh, there are different tools that we, we tend to just be on the tail end of things and that once you've got your VCF file, then you submit it to us. But um, I'll go on to the, well, the website here quickly, sorry. If you go on to the help section and submission, oops, there's a, um, there's a section here called how do I generate a VCF file? And that lists the um, different types of softwares that you can use. And it also has a spreadsheet to VCF file, um, this one here. And then what that does, you download a copy of that. And if you're working, it's very good if you're working with one or two variants. But if you have millions and millions, it can be quite difficult. You're better off using a software. But what that does is that you can then put in your information manually and then follow the instructions. And it will convert from um, a spreadsheet file into a VCF file. 